going into our seventh season of production. Um, can you hear me all right? Or, all right? Okay. Um, so just going into our seventh year, uh, I farm with my sister Rachel. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, we do a lot of direct marketing. We wholesale a very small amount of our products, so the most is direct to consumer. Um, yeah. So yeah, as I mentioned, we grow a really wide uh, diversity of crops. Um, we grow year round. Um, so in the winter months, we're growing both fresh crops, so things that are alive and well, and that we're picking on a weekly basis. And then we have a really busy fall. So we have a lot of crops that we grow for storage that we, yeah, we harvest in the fall and that we're storing throughout the winter months. So the biggest thing with, I find with season extension is your location heavily influences what you are able to do. Uh, us being uh, in Delta, we are really mild in the winter months, even compared to Chilliwack. Uh, we will get minus three, they'll get minus eight. And so that really sometimes is the break point for um, some of the vegetables that we have outside. Um, and the length of everyone's season is different. So, uh, in Delta, the biggest, although we're very mild, the biggest struggle we have is we have very wet soil. Um, it is completely saturated. So we've actually, we put in tile drainage. We have tile drainage in every 30 meters um, in our field. So that's helping us get on the land early, stay on later, and just having happier roots um, in general for the plants. Um, for greenhouses, depending on what snow levels are like, you're going to have to brace certain structures. We don't typically get a lot of snow, um, so it's not a huge consideration uh, for us, but uh, it really depends on if you should have two layers of poly, one layer, if you should have heat or not. Um, and the other consideration for season extension is how much sun you have. If you're in a valley or have a lot of trees in your area, we find in December, January, the most limiting factor is sunlight. And if you don't have a lot of it, it's, it's a lot tougher. So it's really nice to be planting those winter crops uh, in really as open areas as you can if your crop rotation allows for it. So some considerations if you guys don't already grow uh, winter crops um, or storage crops is um, it requires a lot of land. About a third of our land is put in, a third of our acreage is set aside for winter production. So, you know, it requires us to have, you know, a good amount of land. We probably have about five acres of our, our land is into winter crops. Um, and you're doing a lot of succession planting. So, July, you're transplanting out those winter crops. Just as your beans are coming on, you're transplanting out. August, you're weeding. So, so you, it's just, it really adds a lot of extra madness in the summer uh, in September into your farm if you're not already doing it because otherwise you wouldn't be doing you wouldn't be planting those crops um, otherwise and I think the biggest struggle we've found with season extension and starting to do the winter markets is uh, there's less seasonality to the business and there's a lot of advantages um, we get year-round labor um, year-round income and things like that but it we really struggle to take vacations and you really have to think about personal sustainability and things like that that's the thing the, the toughest thing that we've found is uh, season extension there's all these positives to it and to be able to provide year-round um, but we're just uh, between me and my sister really trying to find the the balance um, because before the first few years uh, it was slower uh, and it was kind of nice to have a few weeks of downtime and now it's we have, right now, we're in January, we have two full-time staff and Rachel and myself, so it's very different um, than a couple of years ago. So it's not all a, a bed of roses sometimes, season extension. You really got to make sure it works for kind of your personal goals as well. So cold storage crops. Um, we, these are just a few of what we grow. So potatoes, beets, celeriac, rutabaga, cabbage, uh, kohlrabi. So we harvest these in October, sometimes late September. Um, and we find that they hold really well till early March. Some things are just really great. Potatoes will hold till May, <laughs> if not June. Uh, we find that 
some of the beets are starting to go a little bit soft now, not a huge cull rate, but some are red cabbage just finished up for us. Usually we find end of February is as long as we can um, hold it for. Green cabbage, on the other hand, is doing quite fine, so we still have that um, in cold storage, and carrots have seemed to do fine. We don't wash our car carrots um, as we harvest. We wash them right before they go to market, and so what we find sometimes on the more co the lighter colored carrots, we have really heavy clay soil. We do get a little bit of staining. Um, I know producers who November and December they wash everything, and then so when they're going to a market in February, they already have that clean product. So you're going to reduce that staining on some of the crops. Parsnips is another one. We don't allocate our labor that way, and we'll just have to see if what our customers can can handle for for some of the soil staining. If you have sandy soil, I don't really think it's a prob uh, problem. Yeah, I think the only issue would be if you spend that labor in November and December, you then get a post-harvest disease or there's you're getting a higher incidence of culls and things like that. And then when you go to uh, sell it in March, you've already allocated that washing labor a long time ago and you know it, it's, it's that type of thing I don't think I think it's completely divided it's why exactly it's if your climate allows for you to be washing in March then do it if you have the labor in December or November I, I don't think it's a, a a big deal yeah 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 and I'll go into kind of our walk-in coolers in a bit how we kind of do ours but yeah it's very variable about what people do um, and yeah and I know some people that do sand still oh, yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, I think it depends how much you have you know if, if you're doing an acre of winter carrots it's a lot harder to pack it all in sand um, yeah any other thoughts on storage crops like you know there's parsley root burdock like I don't you know these are just some of the examples we have for kind of long-term storage what about squash that you might not want to keep cold yeah yeah, I got that on my next slide. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So onions, garlic are, are some of the you know some of the other alliums as well. But uh, yeah. So winter squash, um, we find it's very variety specific. Um, what holds well and what doesn't. We can have a lot of squash do well till the end of December. Right about now is what we find. What kind of our powerhouse storage varieties are and what aren't. Um, Spaghetti's a really good one. You find butternut actually holds well. Uh, some of the kabochas are starting to go at this point. It, it just it just depends what uh, what it is. So you what we do is we really um, we have a lot less variety going into March and April for our winter squash, but we make sure that we're growing a lot more of those varieties um, because that's all we have left at that point. So. But this year, and we found that last year we had two or three weeks of like pure fog on Westham, yeah. like just so much moisture. And we last year, this year we've uh, we've been really pleased. I mean, we, there's going to be some, regardless, but uh, we've been yeah a lot happier. Um, and do you keep them in with the cabbages? No. So um, we have two walk-in coolers. One um, we don't cool. Uh, if anything, if it gets cold, we heat, and so all our squash, it's, it's insulated, right? So it's just a, and so we'll throw a little space heater in to keep it at, say, 8 to 10 degrees um, if the weather is, is cool enough that we need to heat it. Um, so yeah, de de all our winter squash is in one area. Um, so they said we get a lot of the potatoes and things like that in, uh, a lot of the roots in by the end of October. Um, we are really watching the end of October and uh, into November, the weather forecast about uh, what cold snaps are coming on and things like that because our celeriac, kohlrabi, and cabbage, we actually leave out as long as we can. Um, so we can get pretty hectic. If on uh, Wednesday you can see that Saturday it's dropping to minus six, uh, we have these lovely people that work with us um, and we are like, well, there's there's like 16 macros that we harvested in two days. So, you know, there's sometimes in November that you're just head down and you're just getting in the rest of the the fall harvest. So it's really great that you know we have 
a, a, a good team and it's about six uh, employees that uh, help pull through to, to get those other crops so um, yeah and the biggest thing is we don't have the time uh, to get those crops it'd be if we had the time in October and September to get in the uh, celeriac uh, we would it's just we have so many roots to get in um, before that that's why it's that's why we wait till November Are you mechanical harvesting all this stuff? No, it, it, uh, potatoes, we have a single row potato uh, digger, but they just kick them out behind and you bin them yourself. So uh, uh, beets and carrots, I've been looking at some uh, <laughs> mechanical ones, but at this point, yeah, it's all by, everything's by hand. Well, beets, well, yeah, okay. What we've found last year, we waited a long time to get the winter squash out. I, I don't know why we waited and it was muddy and this year and then all winter the um, because we're heavy clay that just sticks to that squash mm -hmm. and the labor it took us all winter to clean squash was ridiculous and so this year we really made it a priority to harvest that squash dry and so we did it earlier I mean we had such a nice um, fall that things did mature enough that by mid-September you could go in and basically clear all your winter squash other years we'd be still harvesting squash on Thanksgiving but it'd be wetter and so to reduce because um, if you're going in and storing squash with a bit of moisture on it and they're touching if you don't get the fans on and get rid of that then yeah you're we do for November, December, and a bit into January, and then I don't know if it's laziness or the weather gets better and we don't as much. Yeah, we usually have a fan we, those months and just have a fan just going into that room. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, having constant airflow is, is, is definitely probably the best thing to do. For some reason, it gets turned off some days and it just doesn't get turned on for two more weeks or something. But uh, yeah, something else with storage crops is um, making sure you're harvesting a quality uh, product. Um, diseases really can spread post-harvest and you don't want to have spent, you know, three hours harvesting one of these macro bins, having some weird disease-y one and a month later it's wiped through that entire macro. So for you and for staff, you really want to have your top quality product getting into that macro. The other thing is expensive space. If you're going to cull that beet because there's rodent damage on it, why put it in the bin if you know that in two months you're going to cull it once you've washed it. So having really top quality product going in is really important and having as much for us having as little mud as possible because mud takes up space. So sometimes if it's carrots and it's muddy we are kind of cleaning that mud muck off the carrots because you don't want to have half your bin or maybe like an eighth of your bin full of mud because that's really expensive space um, in your coolers sometimes. Um, yeah, we find, yeah, I said, you know, winter squash kind of ends, uh, some of the squash varieties start to, to rot a bit. So in December, we start to rot, we, we store them all in these big white macro bins. And so uh, starting in December, we rotate. Once we start rotating every two weeks, we rotate into a new macro because if there's one gross squash in that bin, a month and a half later, it's gotten about seven other squash. So we have a bit of more time that time of year. So yeah, every two weeks, it's kind of our rule that we are going in and rotating all our squash bins to get rid of all the, the cull ones just to reduce the spreading. Um, so we have a few kind of what we call winter powerhouse crops that we keep outside in our climate um, and we're harvesting as, as needed basis. So leeks, uh, we leave outside um, and we're still harvesting now. Uh, parsnips are another one, we leave out kale. Um, and kale we find that December and January with a reduced light, not much is going on. Yeah, we're getting, we're harvesting it, it's going to market, but we're not, we ha we're very careful on how much we harvest per week. We, we can't take it all. Um, what we find about a week or two ago, it's really flushed back and we're getting double we got in January. And so, um, yeah, we're going back in and we got lots of kale there. Um, and we kind of talked about before, I know some folks even uh, depending on climate and maybe, and I'm not sure if you guys do this, but um, we don't use straw on our parsnips. Like we leave them out, we just have it open. But I know some of the producers, um, 
around Karameas, they'll have straw over top of their carrots and they'll dig as needed just to deal with the, the frost or the thaw and the, the, the frozen soil type thing. So sometimes if you have, you're in more northern climate, you can still leave your crops out there. They're definitely going to sweeten up uh, nicely. You just need a, a bit of a layer of, of straw to um, prevent freezing. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, like with the tile drainage, it helps. Um, if we have a rain event and we are getting or numerous days of rain, um, we won't necessarily go and dig parsnips the day after or while it's while there is a lot of water out there just because it's it's physically harder to go and dig. Um, this is all by hand. Like we don't have tractors on from November to April. Um, so we have a little bit of flexibility of when we can harvest, but uh, I'll tell, I have, I'll show you a raised bed shaper in a bit because we've kind of learned a lesson this winter on that. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing I find is choosing the right variety for Brussels, for leeks. Um, there's different slots, like there's certain leeks that overwinter really well and there's ones that don't so it's, we really have to be careful what varieties you're picking um, if you want to overwinter. This year we're doing a kale variety trial um, so just seeing which ones are really going to overwinter well because we the, at the farmers market people really really want that kale and sometimes the producers in uh, Chilliwack it dies for them and so we're one of the few producers that have kale because you know we're, we're a bit milder and so if we can find varieties that really overwinter and really are hardy um, outside, then we want to do that because some of the varieties we grow. What's your favorite leek for overwinter? Um, this winter we did a few trials. Um, Lexton was one we did. Uh, they're all hybrid. We don't do any OP. Uh, Lexton, Longton, Belton. So we trialed all three. We're on long tin right now. I think I like Belton best. It was a little thicker, but they're, they're all very similar. Um, yeah, I think there's some really good uh, OP varieties that are quite hardy, but uh, yeah. Do you plant anything in tunnels for winter? Uh, in like hoop houses? Yeah. Yeah. I'll uh, get to that in a sec. Um, so there's a few crops we do uh, that we plant in the fall that we um, won't be harvesting all winter, that we harvest in the spring. So we grow purple sprouting broccoli. Um, after that kale starts to flower, we sell uh, brassica buds or kale tips um, at the markets. Um, green onions, we overwinter and we harvest in uh, March and April. Some people in our area, some of the producers used to do overwintering cauliflower um, and cabbage. We have a problem with um, some of the waterfowl, um, but traditionally some of the old time farmers used to grow this. It's not a sure thing though. You'll, do, you'll have a really cold winter one year and you won't get any crop at all. Other years, it look, you have these beautiful heads of cauliflower in, in March. So it is a bit of a gamble whether it works every year, but I know, um, I know there's a, a producer in Abbotsford that did it last year and had gorgeous cauliflower at the market. So that was just, really uh, nice to see and we do purple sprouting broccoli and that's it's not, it's just nice to have something different or new at the market in March and April it is you know other than just winter squash and roots it's really nice to bring on just something new yeah so um, yeah the question asked do we use uh, greenhouses so we have three poly tunnels um, on our farm so summertime uh, it's all tomatoes, uh, eggplants, peppers, and long English cukes. Um, so kind of those high value crops. We have uh, two movable houses. Um, we have one that's 25 feet by 60 feet, and it can be easily moved by four people. We have another 35 by 80, and that one's double poly. And it is hard to move with six people, <laughs> but doable. Um, we have a few wind concerns in our area. It is extremely windy. Um, we use earth anchors and aircraft cable to secure them. There's many a sleepless nights wondering if it's going to be at the neighbor's field by morning, but um, they've, they've done fine. Um, we, um, 
So on this structure here, there's three sets. It's got tomatoes in it at this point this picture was taken. This uh, was parsley and dandelion. It was going to stay out all winter. And then this crop here, we have kale and then bok choy interplanted. Uh, kale again, radishes, turnips that haven't come up yet, uh, bok choy and more kale. So this was taken mid-September by mid-October. Those tomatoes are hurting. They're not getting the heat. It's unheated, but they're not getting the, the heat from outside. So we roll this over. So this is just pipe. Um, and then we have landscape cloths. We find that this area is a really awkward place, whether it's inside the house or outside the house, to uh, weed. So we just throw land landscape cloth down um, to kind of help um, alleviate that. We also, it's a little bit hard to see, but we've actually ditch witched a trench here because you know, in the winter, it's going to rain. So where's that rain going? You don't want it to be going back in and flooding. So it's either raising your soil up in your greenhouse so that your, uh, you know, that soil's running off. What we do is we have um, a ditch witched and we put in tile drainage that links into our very low in the ground tile drainage and then have wood chips on top to kind of help drain that. And we find that's really critical because when we didn't do that, it was coming back in and you kind of lose some of the value of having a, a drier space there. The other nice thing about movable greenhouses we find is it's, especially for organics, but most for most producers, is the ability to rotate. Um, you kind of always, for the most part, want to grow tomatoes and long English cucumbers in the greenhouse um, in the summer months. Uh, we can't grow tomatoes outside uh, in our area, so um, it's really nice to be able to rotate and to lower the salt levels. Sometimes if you, there's no natural rain, you're going to get some higher salt levels in your greenhouses. So if for two thirds of the year, this is exposed to, to rain and water, those, that salt level is going to drop down. You can sprinkler in your greenhouse to reduce salt. There's other ways you can do it if you have a stationary greenhouse, which we do, but we find that it, it does help alleviate that problem. But you're quite right about the weeding alongside the edges, at least that way you do have a chance of getting out of it. Yeah. Even, even without that. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is our 60 uh, foot, and this guy's the 80 foot, and um, we just put that, we had our first growing year this year, and the manufacturer said, oh, I think this is about as much as you want to pull it with people, and it's true. What we find is by mid to late October, you can use a tractor, and you can winch it and do all sorts of things, but I don't even like to get the tractor on if it's wet and rainy, um, because we are compacting the soil, so if we can do it with us, then, uh, then we do. So the small one you can do with four people, you say? And easy. Yeah. I mean, one-handed, like... You know, twiddling your thumbs type thing. Uh, the other one, it's a one, two, three, heave ho, like very s inching, but but going. Yeah. Yeah. Is it how, how it's rail? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Is it fixed on top of a, another tube there? How do you have it up there? Uh, yeah. So uh, this is a two by six plank of wood, strapped on. There's numerous ways to do it. I wouldn't suggest this is the <laughs> ideal way, but uh, we also have uh, rebar. Uh, into the ground so that these planks aren't moving because you don't want to start rolling your greenhouse and those rails be like splaying out or in and things like that. You really, if it's, if you have a 25 foot house, you want 25 feet. So we just put rebar into this uh, so it is staying at 25 feet type thing. Yeah, I pulled mine with the tractor. Yeah. I have a drawbar. Yeah. Not quite. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's definitely, if you, if you can't, and that was our thing. If we went and tried doing it, yes, it was tough with six people. We were able to do it. That was our backup plan. Yeah. Our struggle was is that this house, we were pulling, this was our next crop. So our tractor had to be 80 feet away from this because we couldn't drive over the crop that we had seeded that it was getting rolled onto. So we were starting to have some logistical um, issues there. So I get really excited about kind of winter growing so you're really using that solar energy I mean these houses are not heated um, this is in February or January last year I think it gets hot in there you have to vent I mean you can see the snow on the ground but it was 30 degrees in there you know by, by mid afternoon you're not getting that in the morning of course so you really um, have to be able to, to vent because the plants really don't like that change uh, so this is our house in uh, early November this year. So we succession planted in there as well. We don't put 
uh, all the spinach in at one time. We'll plant some spinach. This is our uh, stationary house as well. So this is uh, 100 by 35. It has a propane heater. We use that on two occasions. Uh, in the winter months, if it is minus 10, we will heat it to minus one because we don't want these plants to die. So we will, we're not gonna be soft on them and give them five degrees. These plants are not gonna die at minus one. So we'll heat to minus one. Most winters, that means not typically heating at all. Uh, we, this is our propagation house though. So uh, we just started seeding. So in March and April, if we do dip down really cold, this guy will click on as well. But our goal is to, like we've, our propane tank gets filled not even once a year. Like we, we really try not to use it um, that much. Um, this is a really nice house. It has um, automatic vents, um, which if we couldn't do that for the movable because it added an extra thousand pounds to the structure. And with the um, extra electricity and things like that, it just was, kind of hard to have a movable um, structure and vents. But this is the nicest thing because we, Rachel and I would both go to a Saturday farmer's market. We'd leave Ladner at six in the morning. What's the day gonna bring, you know? We gotta crank those greenhouses open because we, we weren't sure what, yeah, the, what the weather was gonna do. Uh, we'd come back home at four o'clock in the afternoon and sometimes it had been, you know, raining or really, really cloudy and you've had your vents open or windy and you've had your vents open all day in our um, movable houses that just have the roll up sides. This thing's amazing. Three degree temperature change. Like there's no, like, and if it's windy, it, it will only open 10% if there's wind. Like it's, there's a definite expense to having that, but it's, it's definitely been a really nice addition for this, our main kind of um, propagation house. Um, yeah, so we don't use row cover in our greenhouses. Um, as I said, we're relatively mild and we really want that light. So I know um, in Northern areas and talking to some of the producers down um, in some parts of the States, they, you know, put row cover on and sometimes they'll just have the row cover on at night, open it up during the day for light and things like that. We <coughs> find that it's mild enough that it's not a concern. And we were just at um, Abbotsford had the LMHIA, the, the grower talks and uh, the Pacific Ag Show. And one of the talks was on nitrate levels. And um, I think that definitely can be a concern if uh, if there's low light and you're growing in hoop houses and you have very thick row cover, um, you really get um, increased nitrate levels. So uh, it is something to watch. It, it was a really interesting presentation. I can't, uh, I just skimmed a bit of learning off of it, but it should be on the LMHIA's website um, about nitrate levels for you guys to look into if, it's, if you do those types of things. But it kind of depended on the level of the thickness of row cover, um, but it is kind of a, it is a concern. You, you don't want really high nitrate levels um, in your, and it's in leafy greens, like spinach, kale, and things like that. Yeah, it's not so much in the roots, but. Um. So kind of for our hoop house crops, we do spinach, chard, uh, salad greens, so lots of different mustards there, um, Asian greens, um, radish, turnips. This year we trialed cilantro. Um, and you know, we can see this area here, this had radishes in it, but by, Oct or by December, radishes are done. Like we've harvested them all. And so in January, we'll go um, and put in something like spinach. The biggest thing is being really cognizant of that rotation, especially with brassicas. You, you, even though there's a lot of brassicas you can grow in the winter months, especially in the hoop houses, you can't, especially in a stationary house, grow brassicas and brassicas and brassicas every year. Like that's, you're gonna run into, a, into issues. So we really, it's, it's really exciting to have some of uh, the spinach and chard and things like that that do well too, that we can, um, and lettuce that we can rotate with. Um, we have really wide walking paths. I know, you know, if Elliot Coleman would probably be very upset that this isn't a one foot walking path. This is, <laughs> I think this is a 30 inches. Um, but yeah, we, we we could do better at density. Um, you could really put your, you could probably have four rows of chard here and things like that. We've kind of le learned a lesson this year that we, we really could have um, increased the density. You always just want to watch um, if your plants are too close together, 
Uh, you just, if you have fans in there, it's great. You just, you, it's just a concern in the winter months. If you don't have a lot of ventilation and things are really close together, you're going to get disease spread easier. So sometimes you just have to balance out having really high density um, and higher disease pressure sometimes. Yeah. Um, we've just started um, our chard, just an example of kind of the, um, the flux in the harvest based on the, the sunlight. Uh, chard uh, in December and January, we might get 20 to 30 bunches um, per week out of this house. Um, but on Friday we got 75. So it really depends on the light and that's only going to increase. Um, we do find chard usually starts to uh, want to flower uh, in about another month by yeah, mid-March mid to late March. It starts to to want to head out, but it's very, uh, the increases on light right now are so fast and those plants are really responding to it. The spinach yield has doubled in a month and things like that. So it's a, you know, it's a bit of a, yeah, those, uh, those days for December and January can be tough and frustrating that things aren't growing as much as you want, but it comes on fast and furious, we find. Um, How do you water? We just have uh, sprinklers, so just garden hose and sprinklers that we have over um, for propagating. We have drop down sprinklers, but we don't, it, it's pretty fine mist. So, and sometimes we just do it as needed. There's certain crops that want a bit more water. So sometimes it is just going in and watering by hand. Some of the crops, if not a lot is needed. So just to add more to like figuring out the rotation in this house is we always know that we start our propagation tent. We have a propagation tent inside the greenhouse too. Um, so we all started on one side and so we're very, uh, you know, we start here so I know that this crop is actually already gone. It was this year, it was all Asian greens, it's done. So I have one bed that's completely open so we'll get probably 300, 400 trays down that, that bed this year and then this <coughs> is salad greens that are not looking too, you know, that's starting to go. So I also try to stage um, what I'm planting and where based on when I can rip things out, does that make sense? Um, yeah, it's not perfect. Like we're looking at putting up, a com we're looking at turning this into a complete propagation house, gravel floor, like gravel, just so you're not slipping when you're irrigating and things like that, and building another house because this is a very dynamic space and exactly, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's really hard to juggle all the things. And same thing, we rip out our tomatoes sooner than we want to in the fall. Um, because we have to get our winter crop in. So uh, we've kind of started moving away from row cover, um, except for um, making sure insects aren't there. Uh, but we don't really use it for heat retention anymore. We find the economics in the spring don't necessarily work. We find that if we uh, seed carrots and we'll put row cover on, um, you know, to get a jump start in the spring, we'll take it off and weed it. And if we put it on right away, those weeds just reroot, and then we come back a week later and weed it again, and weed it again. So sometimes we weed three times, and to me that is not acceptable. So that's something that we've moved away. And I'm, you know what? If our carrots are two weeks later, I don't. It's okay. It is. <laughs> if we have really reduced sales for the month of May and into June, other than we need to, for us, we need to make sure we have something for our CSA. But I just. I've gotten lazy. I just it's it's a it's a it's a tool that I think <laughs> And for cabbage root maggot, we've moved away from this because it's humid. Um, we get the stuff from Dubois out of Quebec. It's um, just netting. So it's um, quite a bit more expensive. Um, but that's what we use for cabbage root maggot on and we just use it for rutabaga like we don't grow radishes and turnips in the summer months. Like we just don't do it. So just for our fall turnips, and it's not perfect. We still cull, like we still have uh, higher than the conventional producers. Yeah. Um, so raised beds. We can talk parsnips. So what we found is we had nine beds of parsnips this year. Three not under poly. Sorry, not sorry. Three not on raised beds, and the rest um, had raised beds. And um, we had to. We just left one as 
as a trial, no, we just left one, and we found when we went to go dig it that did not have the, row, have the raised beds, it did get waterlogged, and we were finding higher incidence of culls, so we've left it. So that was interesting, um, and now the ones that we have raised beds, they're still fine, um, not waterlogged. It's, it's not a huge, you can see, I mean, it's not a, it's four or five inches, but it's enough that it is um, a benefit. Um, and maybe, you know, if you know that your September, October, November parsnips, you don't have to do raised beds on, but basically uh, December into the new year, you're gonna wanna be harvesting off of raised beds. Um, and then this is just a flame weeder. <coughs> That's just for parsnips, we flame weed that and try to flame weed carrots too. Yeah. So yeah, it's a machine on the tractor we get from Buckeye, the actual um, bed shaper, and we do it, um, we'll probably try it on garlic next year as well. And, uh, and even purple sprouting broccoli, we found that some of it got a little bit waterlogged. Um, so some of those spring crops, it might be a benefit to um, do on raised beds. The balance always is having the time to go in and do the prep. Um, the other thing we have is we have a tunnel layer it's, uh, so we'll have, uh, this is mostly for spring to get on a little sooner. We have a uh, poly layer. So we have black plastic for some of our summer crops. So we'll go lay the black poly, uh, transplant, zook or eggplant. Um, and then we'll come in with another machine, which is a tunnel layer. Somebody sitting on, it's a, it goes behind the tractor. Somebody's sitting on the um, tunnel layer and feeding a wire into this machine, which then bends it, and then behind it's perforated clear plastic and makes mini tunnels. Um, it's pretty nifty, it pro you know, it's gonna get you on sooner in the season. Um, I think it's great for places in more northern areas. We find that we're pretty mild, but we don't get on till sometimes late April, early May because it's so wet. It's not, it's not the, the heat or anything like that. It's the, or frost, it's, the fact that we are so wet. But it goes really quick in May and we are, 24 hour temperatures are pretty good that for us, I don't necessarily think the tunnel layer was the best investment, but talking to folks up in Pemberton, it cools quite a bit down during um, the night and I think the tunnel layer would um, be a lot better suited for that and maybe places like the Okanagan where it does cool down, but it goes eight degrees at night and it's not, um, it's not a big thing for our plants, we find, so, yeah. So how we harvest, our kind of fall harvest, uh, this is a pretty familiar site for us, is the tractor and the macro bins. Um, these are about 250, 300 bucks. Um, they're food safe compared to the wooden bins. They're really easy to wash. They're almost indestructible. We've, you know, we, we haven't lost one completely yet, and we've had them for six years, so. Um, and they're great, move them around with the pallet jack, with the tractor forks and things like that. So they're really efficient for our larger harvests. Um, and we get them from Dubois as well. There's some local suppliers around here, but we find that they're the most economical, even to get shipped out from Quebec. Um, yeah, so all, and all of our winter squash is harvested into this, potatoes, yeah, tons of stuff. Quite an investment. Once you get 40 of these that cost $300 each, it's, it's quite the investment. Um, yeah, so if you can get, if um, how you're marketing doesn't matter, then if you have apple bins and things like that, then you can probably get away with stuff like that. Um, so kind of moving into kind of post-harvest infrastructure, um, we have two walk-in coolers. Uh, they are 15 by 20, so 300 square feet each. Uh, we can get 18 pallets in each one. Um, there's a center drain can't really see it that well, but there's a center drain because when sometimes when you're going in and you've been uh, washing kale or something like that, there's going to be moisture left on, so you don't want, <laughs> you need somewhere for that water to go. Um, the lighting in there is shatterproof, so food safe lighting, just in case for some reason you nail that. Um, these coolers can go down as low as one degree Celsius. Uh, the paneling inside is really easy to wash down, so you can spray down that entire cooler, no problem. Um, and as we kind of mentioned, it acts as uh, the, our other cooler acts more as an insulator um, in the winter months, so putting a heater in. So they're kind of multi-purpose um, if you don't need to cool. To cool. Um, yeah. 
So how are you moving around your your macro bins in there then? You can't get a tractor in there, somebody. Pallet yeah. jack. Yeah. So you're stacking them outside and yeah. then you're moving in. Two yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we can only do two high. I wish I had figured out three high. It's like yeah. Things you learn, eh? Oh yeah, yeah, you got it. Although I don't know if I could actually push in three pallets worth. Yeah, and yeah, yes. Um, so some of the other things in here, we have two whiteboards um, in our in our post harvest area. One is our communication board. Uh, we've got notes for each other on it when supplies run out. Just General communication. Sometimes you do not see another staff member for a couple hours and you just need to write something down really quick. Communication board, everyone goes and looks at it, um, checks it throughout the day. Um, the second one is this one up here and it is um, kind of our master allocation seat. So we do farmers markets, CSA, we sometimes we have special orders, we have a farm stand. Um, so we have each crop somewhat alphabetically here. Uh, up top is uh, farm stands, CSA, special orders, you know, all of our different ways that we're, we're selling that product. We have, it looks like lettuce, 100 head of lettuce wanted to go to a certain farmer's market. So I write down, we want 100 for this market. Somebody checks off once it's washed and in the cooler, <laughs> checks off, yep, 100 went in. Or sometimes it looks like we circle a new number. So actually we wanted 100, but 75. So sometimes, right, your harvest uh, realities aren't necessarily, um, are different than what, what you, you wanted. So, um, yeah, so it's very uh, dynamic and it changes, right, because you have new things coming on each week um, and different special orders or different restaurant sales. So at the end of each day, I take a picture of this and then I go up um, and we have an Excel spreadsheet and I'm inputting for our market sales data. So when we go to market, we have a clipboard um, and it has, you know, what the date is, what market we're going to, uh, the price of things. So we'll have beets, three bunches, or well, more like 30 or 50 bunches, but, uh, and then we'll have a column for returns. Sometimes you don't sell all what you bring, right? And so you need to allocate, uh, or you need to know what you're selling compared to what, you're har what you have harvested because it is different. Um, we also have a blackboard you can kind of see in the corner there and this is our weekly plan of what's going on that week so we have Monday to Saturday what we want to get done each day so staff kind of knows um, yeah what the week plan looks like and what what we're getting done and what we're not um, and our loading bays we have two Isuzu trucks and so our loading bay is just outside the door so uh, yeah pull them out pull the pallets out and load them into the truck um, so it's I love paper, but uh, have you considered that? Yes, we actually have uh, the, there's a, a guy who does it for um, some of the larger farms in our area. And um, he worked with my parents' farm um, making, he used to be my parents' employee and then he ended up um, doing, doing it. And it's actually a labor data system and then it's a production data or production uh, collection. And so it is really, um, yeah, so we have it. It's sometimes implementing it and having it there. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, we're the technology's there. Our own system, but yeah. We, do you have the information on that one? Yeah, I can send that to you. Yeah, I'll. It's. Um, then you bring your tablet to market, and then you, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you change all the numbers of what's returning yeah. versus what you brought, and then it should. Yeah, especially for organic certification, like we have to have all that information and. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really nice to be able to print out a sheet and it has all the correct stuff. Yeah, I'll try to get that information. It's, um, he's out of Surrey and it's I, IT intuition or something. Okay. His name's Bill Singh. Bill Singh? Like yep. uh, everything they And handling. Yeah. And it's, it's lifting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really look at that. I mean, if, I think one of the, um, the toughest things with, with Sometimes with farmer's market, you're up at 5.30, packing the truck, lifting those bins. You get to market, you're lifting those bins out. Mm -hmm. You're packing up the farmer's market, you're packing them in. You get home from market, you're packing it out. You're lifting 10,000, you're lifting, honestly, I've calculated, it's like 10,000 pounds. And you can't, I'm 30, 
but <laughs> it's not going to get any better. <laughs> and it's. They get heavier. Yeah, they do. I've noticed that. <laughs> but it's, I think that that is, you really have to watch your body and ergonomics and things like that. So if you can find, and I, kn I know a producer in Abbotsford that does something similar. He's got a cool bot in there. And yeah, they loaded in Friday night. And so he can, he's got, he can sleep in for about an hour longer than we can. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, so for our post-harvest area, um, all of our tables are stainless steel. Um, we got two laundry sinks you can see there, um, and uh, we have our water. It's all city water, it's piped up top, so we're not uh, tripping over hoses as much. Um, our floor it's cement, but it is um, graded to a central drain, so it's uh, really nice. The water just kind of flows right to it. Um, the walls. It's a food safe wall paneling, so really nice to spray down. Um, and we got windows, especially in the winter months, it's really nice to have natural light. Obviously there's lights up above as well, but it's really nice to have um, the natural light and kind of see outside. Um, we, um, everything's washed down at the end of the day. Like that's the last job at the end of the day is making sure that post harvest area is left clean. Um, at the beginning of the day, we sanitize all the stations. Um, yeah. So this is our leafy green sink. Um, the only thing that goes in this sink are leafy greens. Um, we just want to use as much extra precautions with those more sensitive food safe crops. Um, in the corner of the photo, this is, this is an overturned bin, but this bin, the overhead doors right here, when we walk in uh, to the barn, we have our knives from harvesting celeriac or kale or whatnot, this bin's usually flipped over. We dump our dirty bins or dirty knives into this bin and we don't use those knives again unless they're sanitized. So we go and get new knives every day. So we only use those knives for kind of one job um, each day. So it's just a really right inside the door. One of the first things you do, drop your dirty knife and um, kind of continue on. So you don't butcher your chickens here? No. And you know what? We've we used to have 200 or we still had there's still 200 head of chickens on the farm um, it used to be part of my operation and my parents have taken that over I it was really hard to be collecting eggs every day um, and just having those two types and I know I'm really happy that we can still have that on a part of our farm but I'm happy that it's not me or my staff uh, day to day um, being a part of that because I think there are some food safe concerns it's tough it's yeah it's tough but it's get our we're at 50 like if we were at three acres we'd probably still be doing it but we get to a certain acreage and i think the acceptable level of risk increases so yeah yeah we try to try to keep it as clean and it's, you know dogs aren't in there cats not in there there's nothing in there like we you know yeah um so yeah it's kind of cut off but outside the door here um, we have an outside post harvest area too so um, it's extra workspace. With that being said, we have tubs and stuff. We have a cover on them, so we, f you know, we or we flip those bins over. We have a huge Rubbermaid um, dunk tank, so when it's not in use, it's flipped over and it gets sanitized before we use it again. Um, just because they are definitely uh, beautiful, but uh, we got those barn swallows and they really like to uh, nest up top, so we got to put up netting and things like that to kind of prevent them. Starlings. Yeah. Well, and, you know, our next door neighbor is a big blueberry farmer, so we get blueberry cannons going. And uh, they come on over to our place pretty quick, just because you know, they're, they're getting, getting away from their place. Yeah. Um, so with post-harvest, one of the biggest things is we don't want to spend a lot of time um, in post-harvest. Uh, well, yeah, we just don't want to spend a lot of time in post-harvest. So what we want to do is have a really good quality product going into the barn. Um, so we've really been working on our um, harvesting protocols um, and standards so we have a good product. Um, we have three kind of quality checks. One's the field, one's in post-harvest, and one's at the farmer's market. And it becomes more expensive further down the line if you're calling that. Um, there's Roxbury Farm in New York State. They have a big uh, manual, uh, harvest manual. We've kind of taken kind of their ideas and we went through with our staff uh, last winter on harvest protocols, just especially for new, um, for bringing new people onto your team and they've never worked on a farm before. <coughs> it's a lot of information. If you know that you're gonna go and um, 
harvest basil for the first time in three days, you can say, hey, new staff member, maybe look at the basil uh, harvest protocol and you can, you know, can see like issues with downy mildew, how to pick, you know, so that when you go and teach them the very first time, they have a little bit of information um, already. So um, yeah, we find we just kind of have what bins that need to go in, like what bin to use, what knives you need, kind of how long it should take and things like that. So, um, yeah. so we harvest into pickup trucks or onto the, um, in the, onto a pallet with a tractor. Uh, if we're out there a long time, we'll be used putting shade cloth over top of this. Um, we're pretty mild, so we don't have, it's, you know, doesn't go above 25 very often. So we don't have a lot of field heat issues. Um, but we only try to leave things out there for two hours max before it's in the barn. Um, bins, we use stackable nestable bins. Um, we have four different bin sizes. Um, we got a printout on the wall for what crop goes into what uh, bin. Everybody's a different size and we find 30 pounds is a pretty good weight that we can all um, carry. But some of our guys can have the highest bin and carry it. But you know, some of our farmers market help can't, so we have beans go into this size, uh, potatoes into this, you know, radishes into this. So there's a listing uh, in our post harvest what bin for what crop. Um, and we also have a bagging sheet too. We have different size bags, bags with holes, things like that. Same thing, there's a list for bagging kale, it's 155 grams, it goes into a bag with holes in it type thing, so that that information is kind of readily available. Um, um, you know, I said we try to have really good high quality product going into the post harvest, but so these are still going to be things that we have to compost. So we just have, uh, this is our kind of compost bin that we have in post harvest and at the end of the day we will it out to the compost. Um, so it's just nice instead of having a few bins or things like that, it's just, yeah, nice and wheely. Um, root washer. Um, most of our harvest or post harvest we do by hand, but the root washer is our most mechanized tool. So spuds, beets, rutabaga, parsnips, carrots are rolling through here. You take all the tops off then? Yeah, yeah, beforehand, yeah. So we started hunched over with a bathtub, you know, and so we've moved up to this and it, it really was a big step up. We wash between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds uh, per week in the winter months. So it's, once you're doing a certain amount of roots, it's really critical to have this. There's all sorts of models. I'm not saying this is the best ones. There's some really nice ones um, out of Europe. Um, and you just got to think how big your farm's growing if you need to have completely stainless steel ones. That sometimes is a requirement depending on yeah how you're selling your product. But we found that a root washer was a really big... between That and the pallet jack has uh, made life really, really a lot easier. So we like to organize as much of the chaos as possible on our farm. So uh, we have all our scales for market, but also for bagging, labeled which ones where they're going. Um, we have a salad spinner, um, so that's you know 200 bucks. And then just this week, <coughs> after five or six years, we have to get a new set of gears. But it uh, lasts a really good long time. So we have all our bags there, and then all our knives, different types of knives, all kind of um, organized, and bag tapers for CSA and sometimes for market too, we'll be uh, you know, doing two pound potato bags and so instead of tying them up by hand, it's like you, you, you do you know, 100 bags of potatoes, leave them open and then you come back through and choo, 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 closing them all up instead of tying them by hand. So we found, especially for CSA and winter, we bag a lot of stuff in the winter months. So we found that that's been, um, yeah. I, I know, we, uh, we're kind of at this point, we're not sure which way we're going to go. We're either going to drop greens because it's starting to be a food safe, we're getting a big push on that aspect, or so we're either going to reduce it um, or, yeah, start investing in kind of some higher stuff. So we've kind of been at this point where, yeah, because we do about 40 kilos a week, like we don't do a lot, and so, yeah, it's either... So we'll have um, two baseboard heaters um, underneath, so for bottom heat, and then there'll be like um, plastic, um, then we'll have poly. So it's not well it is, because then we have, the, well yeah, and then we have those quick hoops, um, and then so then, yeah, so it's basically like a little greenhouse inside the greenhouse. With, 
Uh, no, they are about this high up, so it's raised up. We have um, cedar planks, um, and then I should have had a picture. It's yeah, I'm not. No, um, the UBC is doing a trial on our farm this year to have different color poly, um, like red and green, and yeah, different things just to to see because they I guess de depending sometimes it's better for different crops and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what they do. The biodegradable. This isn't a good reason, but I just, I don't understand how it, like, this is just my own, I just don't understand how it degrades. It seems very strange. I just, it's, to me, it's plastic, and I know that it's corn-based, like, I get it. I just, I can't, I'm a very, I just, I don't, I don't trust it. I'm not, there's, that's, there's no scientific basis for me to say that. I just, it's, it's just strange to me. But, like, I know producers definitely do it, and they're happy with it. Um, Um, we have like uh, S times and uh, like so we have some mechanical uh, weed control um, and like little spider we call them spiders that go between poly crops like in the walking paths so we have some mechanical but yeah we're out there um, with hose as well and we just got a basket weeder so we'll see for some of the crops how that does yeah not yet I think what we found is when we jumped from three and a half to ten acres like we had to get into mechanical cultivation like we could not keep going out there with hose so we're just, it's really awkward right now because we're just getting to it and it's not perfect and it's kind of switching our production system and things like that. So it's, we definitely, we've bought an equipment and just, you don't know if it's going to work with your soil conditions sometimes, things like that. So it's been a bit, yeah. Yeah, and like the biggest thing is we find is if things aren't growing as much in December and January, like, I'm fine with that. <laughs> and so is staff. Like, we've we've really we can't push it for our for our own being like we just it is not worth it like you all like what is the opportunity cost <laughs> and we really find like the bigger the bigger the house and double poly like the growth between um the single layer and the double without being heated it's bigger like it's def and especially if probably in a colder climate it would be even even better to have that extra insulation um, and even having a bigger house in general, it's better airflow, uh, less disease. Like we really like the, our 25 by 60. I mean, it was our very first house, but like it's, it, the yield we get out of it is a lot less than the other two. And the technology out of Europe is utterly amazing. Like my dad's a greenhouse consultant. So there's Fruit Logistica in Berlin. He just got back two weeks ago and the pamphlets he brought back about low tunnels, high tunnels, you know, like lots of strawberries and things like that. But uh, it's just phenomenal. Like there's so much technology out there uh, for season extension out of those countries. So, yep, it costs a pretty penny, but if you're the one that has strawberry, like there's a producer in, in, who goes to the Vancouver Farmer's Market that has berries in April, strawberries. Like he's got a two month window on everybody else. So it's, you just have, if, if your niche, you know, if that's what your niche is and yeah, if you, economics allow for it, but it is kind of pretty cool stuff that they do it there because their land base is so small and they have a lot of, you know, pressures and things like that, it's expensive. So they really want to push um, to be as productive as possible, so it's kind of cool. You're, you're uh, the two are about five feet apart. Yeah, so that's the other thing. We try to make sure winter time wise, or even any time of the year, that they're not right beside each other because that's reducing light as well. So we always try to want it staggered in some way. We lime for just for the pH. Um, and I mean, over time, hopefully, you know, you're adding those the compost and amendments, it's going to get a little less. Um, but it's but it's you know it's you just sometimes where you live you know what your blessings are and you know what the curses are i know that we don't get on till the end of april i like when my friends tell me that they're plowing in february in yarrow i like i <laughs> great <laughs> like, it, sure, it stresses me out for the first little while but really it's it is what it is and uh you know what your boundaries are and what you're able to do and you just do the best you can with what you what you got right because the heavy clay it holds the fertility so well. We don't have to irrigate as much because if it rains in the summer, then it's, it holds it better and things like that. So there are blessings that come along um, with each soil type. You just need to learn how to work with it.
All right. Yeah, thanks, guys.